Hi friends, it's good to be with you today for a message from God's Word. I'm Pastor Corey. Hey, I spent a lot of time this week, well really it was probably just a few hours, but it was not fun. Uh, I was looking at sewage and sewer pipes and uh, we had some sewage back up in the church basement. Don't worry, it's all taken care of. And that's because there were some great folks that uh, helped us uh, clean up our problem. There was a cleaning company involved. There was, a, there was folks that helped us diagnose our problem. There was plumbers involved and ultimately solved the situation so it wouldn't happen again in the future. You could say this, uh, all was not well with our sewer pipes last week. Now, a couple of weeks before that, we did not know that all was not well. All seemed well, because you could keep that stuff hidden from sight, the, the blockage that I'm going to talk about later. We, we, we didn't know it was there. Now, the sewer system, it's, if you didn't know this, it's really important that it works, right? Uh, but like a lot of things that we need to work, we want it out of sight. We don't want to think about it. We want it out of sight, out of mind, and that makes sense. But uh, we need the real solution for what's broken. So today, as we continue our Advent series where we're talking about all is well, what does that really mean? How can we say all is well in a world where there's obviously things that are broken? Where is the real problem, and is it hidden from our sight, and how do we really have all be well uh, through Christ? Let, let's pray as we dive into God's word once again to consider how all is well in Christ. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts May they be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, dear Lord, for you are truly our rock and redeemer. You alone are the one that we should rightly fear. You alone should we fully follow. You alone should our lives be founded upon. You are our rock and redeemer. So, Lord, we pray that your spirit would give us ears to hear, that we would hear what you are saying. I pray for anyone listening to this right now, whether it's live, uh, whether it's uh, recorded, Lord, I pray that they would be praying for themselves, that they would be praying that they could hear your spirit, that they could hear what they need, food for their soul, Lord. I pray that as we listen to this, people would be praying for me and for this message, that it would reach those who you want to grab hold of, Lord, that we would be in awe and wonder of you and what you did through the Christmas story, through coming into the world and how you're going to come again, God. Oh, Lord, may we have ears to hear how all is well in Christ. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going back in time about 700 plus years to the prophet Micah. And we heard a, a, a message from Micah chapter 4 last week. We're going to hear from Micah chapter 5 this week. A prophecy about God's salvation plan. Micah 5, starting with verse 1. Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But you, O Bethlehem Ephratah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. All right. This is the word of the Lord. And we are hearing from the prophet Micah, who served uh, during multiple kings back 700 or so years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And he is saying that the situation is, folks, there is a siege against us. The people who lived at that time knew that. They knew uh, that the Assyrians were to the east, right? You could see it on the map that, that they would have raids and attacks into their land of Judah, into the southern part of what we would call Israel. And you could imagine if you lived at that time your livestock getting stolen your children's lives being threatened family members killed or kidnapped in this ongoing conflict and the nation of Israel is not united there's tribes up in the north that call themselves Israel or Samaria there's there, there's the tribes in the south that call themselves Judah and it's not like 250 years before when David and Solomon had the kingdom united it's a it's a divided time it's a difficult time you know, it's a time when there's division and disease and war. And, and he's saying in verse 1, Now muster your troops. Be ready to fight. That's their life. Be ready to fight. 
With a rod, they will strike the judge of Israel. I mean, even our leaders are at threat. Our leaders are embarrassed by the, by the powers of this world. <laughs> Imagine a, a world where your leaders were embarrassed by the powers of this world. But the, the message paraphrase helps us with a blunt wording of the situation. The message says, but for now, prepare for the worst, victim daughter. Siege is set against us. They humiliate Israel's king, slapping him around like a rag doll. Right? Like a rag doll. This, the siege they were going through then is not unlike the situation we're in now in the world. There's still enemies that, that want to undermine us, right? Whether it's people who are against you inside your family, or it's brokenness in this world, or it's disease that can attack our bodies. There are things that are against us. There is brokenness in this world, and there is spiritual enemy, spiritual evil. So be ready to fight. Be on guard. This is the world we live in, right? But God says, oh, I have a solution for that. He says in Micah's time then, and he's saying to us, now I have a solution. You, O Bethlehem, from you shall come forth from me one who is going to be the, the shepherd, the great solution, right? He's saying, I'm going to fight back. God is going to fight back against the sieges that come against us uh, and his people. But how is he going to fight back? Well, a couple hundred years before, 250 or so years before, he had said to the to good King David, he'd said, I am going to bring a king from your line that will establish a kingdom forever, and this king will reign forever. He said this is 2 Samuel 7. You can go check it out. 2 Samuel 7. God said through the prophet Nathan to David, one will come from your line who will establish the kingdom forever. And the, the Jewish people, the people of Israel, believed this promise as they should have, that there would be a forever king from David's line. And David's line is connected to Bethlehem, right? David was from Bethlehem. And so the, Micah is tapping into this, this legacy of God's promise to bring a Messiah from David's line, to bring a Messiah from this small town of Bethlehem that's a few miles out of Jerusalem, right? Uh, David was a shepherd, and there's going to be this shepherd king, Micah is saying, from this small town. We cannot forget God's promise. He is going to fight back. He's going to fight back from what looks to be small and isolated, this small town, but but God's going to raise up a shepherd who's going to rule us. And his plan is from of old. It's from ancient days, or the King James Version has. It's from everlasting. God has always been promising to do this. This has always been his plan. His plan is from everlasting. But from you, the message version says, you, Bethlehem, David's country. You're the run of the litter. From you will come the leader who will shepherd Israel. He'll be no upstart, no pretender. <laughs> Now, he takes some liberties with the language there, but the point is, he, he, God is going to come into this small, out-of-this-way place, uh, the runt of the litter, as the message says, and, and from that area is going to come the leader. Someone's going to be born in Bethlehem and is going to be the true leader and, and bring the true kingdom, right? Well, what is his timing of this? I wonder, the people probably wondered then. What is his timing of this? And he says, he shall give them up. God will give them up until that time when the birth happens, right? Until the birth. The kingdom won't be really established until this special birth. That's what it says in Micah. Now, after Micah gave this prophecy, the 700 years between this prophecy and the birth of Christ, there was... There was defeat after defeat and embarrassment after embarrassment for the Jewish people. There was, there was captivity. There was conquering by, by, by the Assyrians, by, by the Babylonians, by the Greeks, by, by the Romans. I mean, and, and, and you're wondering, when is this going to happen? And the message is when the birth happens, right? And, and then I want to say back to him as a, as a person, I want to say, uh, we need something bigger than the birth of one guy who's going to be a shepherd from Israel. I mean, look at our enemies. Look at the Roman Empire. Look at what they're doing. We, birth is pretty common, God. I was born. You were born. Everybody here was born. A birth of one person is going to celebrate or, or solve this solution? We're going to celebrate that? How about some bigger things, God? How about some fireworks? How about some real power, you know? I mean, do something big. Do something like you used to do. Do something like we heard about back in 2 Chronicles 5. Let me, let me just read to you what happened in 2 Chronicles 5 after David's son Solomon established the temple and did all the things he was supposed to do. These amazing things happened. I just want to step back in time and say, God can do this. So why didn't God do this 
as the salvation plan. He's preparing a birth. But, but let's hear what happened in 2 Chronicles 5. So all the work that Solomon had performed for the house of the Lord was completed. Then Solomon brought the items his father David had dedicated, the silver, the gold, and all the furnishings, and he placed them in the treasures of the house of God. Fast forwarding to verse 11. Now all the priests who were present had consecrated themselves regardless of their divisions. And when the priests came out of the holy place, all the Levitical sing singers, Asaph, Heman, Jaduthin, and all their sons and relatives stood on the east side of the altar, dressed in fine linen, playing cymbals, harps, and lyres, accompanied by 120 priests, sounding trumpets. The trumpeters and singers joined together to praise and thank the Lord with one voice. They lifted up their voices, accompanied uh, by trumpets, cymbals, and musical instruments, and praised the Lord. Now, this is what I'm talking about, folks. This is an amazing service of worship and praise. It's loud, right? It's beautiful. For he is good, they sang. His loving de devotion endures forever. And the temple, the house of the Lord, was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not stand there to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Wow. That's what I'm talking about. People singing, blowing trumpets, a big old choir. This is a nice religious look to everything. This, is, this sound is great. This is beautiful. This is how we know the world is changing. The, the, the cloud of the presence of God fills the temple. People can't even get in. This is the obvious thing that's going to save us or change us. This is the same thing God did back in Exodus chapter 40 when he filled the tabernacle and the, the, the presence of the God, uh, Lord God was so thick at the tent of meeting that tabernacle that... It was full like this presence. Wow, this is what I'm talking about. And now, a few hundred years later, God's saying, you know, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do a birth. I'm going to do a birth. A child being born. Somewhere down the line, there's going to be this important birth. It's going to come from Bethlehem. And that's going to do it. A birth? God's plan is a birth? Yeah, a birth. A child like no other. A birth of someone who will become the great shepherd. And this is what is going to be truly majestic. So let's talk about his method. This, this one who's going to be born, what is he going to do? He, he's going to become one who will stand and shepherd his flock. And he will shepherd his flock, it says, in the strength of the Lord. And this is what the people will really need to be God's people and God's kingdom. Well, what is the strength of the Lord, isn't it? Isn't it got to be stronger than Rome? Isn't it got to be stronger than the empire of Greece or Babylon? Well, well, what could be stronger than them that could come from a shepherd? Well, the strength of the Lord, the greatest strength in the world is the deep love of God. And that's what the shepherd is going to have. That's what that shepherd is going to be. He's going to do the best for us and love us in the deepest possible ways and solve for us the things we could not solve for ourselves. He's going to, he's going to release inside of us what is broken. And he's going to free us. He's going to break the chains that bind us, right? He's far stronger than the chariots that attacked the people in Micah's time, the chariots that came from Assyria, he's far stronger than that. The love of the Son of God is far stronger. Jesus Christ, the great shepherd, was strong because he was willing to lay down his life for the sheep. And the world had never seen something like this. And this is the story of Christmas, that the Son of God would step out of eternity and do what Jesus said in John 10, 11. He, he says about himself, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. What would change us? What was powerful enough to change us? What was more powerful than the cloud of God's presence filling the temple? What was more powerful than that was God becoming one of us. And not just becoming one of us, but becoming one of us who would never sin and used his perfect life to take our brokenness upon himself. He knew that there was a, a brokenness in this world. He knew that there was an enemy, a thief, a liar, the evil one who was trying to seek and destroy us. And so he came to undo that one, to do battle with the darkness, to do battle with evil, the darkness that's out there and inside us. John 10, 11 is preceded by John 10, 10. And John 10, 10 says this, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have life abundantly. Jesus came to to defeat the darkness out there, the evil one, and how the evil one has entangled with us. The thief in Micah's time, the thief in Micah's time looked like the Assyrian uh, 
occupation and military. But the true thief then and now that was underneath the Assyrians and that's underneath in our hearts, the true thief then and now is the lie, right? That we can be good on our own. That we don't need God. The lie that, that the evil one wants. The lie that the evil one even twists us up with Christmas and makes Christmas into some sentimental hallmark holiday. The lie then, the lie now. Is that there is no darkness to overcome. You surely won't die. That's what he said in the garden. The lie, though, the, the liar is so evil that he can whisper into the ear of someone like Herod and says, yeah, you know what would be a good thing to do? Kill the babies in Bethlehem. Kill the babies in Bethlehem. That would be good because then you could stay king and you can take care of the people. You know what would be good, Eve? Eat that fruit that God told you not to eat. You surely won't die. You don't need to follow his lead. You can take control on your own. And there was something in Eve that wanted to believe that. And there was something in Herod that obviously wanted to believe that killing the babies was better. And there's something in us that believes that going our own way and not calling sin, sin, and thinking we can be good on our own, there's something broken in us underneath the surface that we don't want to admit is there, that we need dealt with. Christ's approach, you see, his method, what he was always planning to do from of old, from everlasting, was to come into this world and do battle with evil and how it's gotten into us. The enemy is not just out there. The enemy is within our gates. The enemy is within our hearts. Evil is in us, and we need him to root it out and finish it. The evidence is all around us in the ways we hurt one another, in the ways we sabotage our own selves. The clog, you see, is in our own soul. It's invisible to the eye, but it's there. Just like the cap we had in our line this week. You know what plugged our line? A cap that's supposed to go on the outside to protect stuff from getting in the line. Now, we don't know where it came from. All our caps are accounted for but a cap that is exactly the same diameter of the sewer pipe is perfectly designed to be a protection, got inside and plugged up our line, and plugged it up really well. And religion or self-righteousness can do that. Something that's designed to be good, and and if you use God's ways and God's teachings to guide you and protect you, they're, they're good if you let God lead. But if you think your religion on its own If you put it down inside your heart and you think doing things morally, you think going to church, you think going to Christmas service once a year and Easter too, you think that that is going to make you better, is going to free you from the evil, you think think that? The truth is, when you think just observance or religion is going to save you, what you're doing is you're putting a nice, perfectly designed plug in your heart Your sin is not being dealt with. Your evil is not being overcome. It cannot be overcome by your own efforts. You need the one who came to take it away, to take all of it away, to break the power of evil. So this is what we need. Ephesians, Paul says in Ephesians 4, 9 and 10, he says, what does he ascended mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the very one who ascended above all the heavens in order to fulfill all things. You see, Christ is the one above all things. He is in the heavens with the Father right now, but He chose in eternity when He created us and He knew we'd be broken. He chose to descend into our brokenness and He who had never sinned, He who is perfect and holy, chose to become sin, Paul writes elsewhere. He chose, He knew no sin, but He took on our sin so that we could enjoy and become His righteousness. He entered into our brokenness and took it upon Himself. This has been prophesied about for centuries before He did it. 
The psalmist wrote about it too. King James in Psalm 40 verse 2 says, He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. This is the story of Christmas, that God comes down into the brokenness of this world. He, he is born into an unclean stable. He comes down into your pit. He doesn't just magically make a majestic Christmas that you have to believe because of some cloud or beautiful sounds. No, no, it's far more beautiful than that. He comes down into the brokenness and knows exactly who you are. He knows exactly your worst stuff. He knows you on your worst day, your worst thoughts, your brokenness, all the terrible stuff that should have never happened to you. He knows it and he came down into it and he says, I hate that. I hate that they've laid siege against you. I want to free you from that. I want to bring you out of the pit. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to go down into the pit and I'm going to bring all the pit upon myself and I'm going to vanquish it forever. He descended to do what we could not do for ourselves. So why didn't God just rip over the heavens? Why didn't God just build another temple and fill it with another cloud? Why didn't God just do the obvious things, the big things, and everybody could say, oh yeah, there's a God who does miracles. Obviously, I believe in him. Because God knew our real problem. And he knew if he did it that way, and he'd done it many ways like that before. He knew that we would just be self-righteous about it. And our real problem and our hearts would not be healed. Because the deep problem was deep inside of us. The mire and the sludge, the brokenness, the evil one and the evil in the world that entangles our hearts and needs the perfect love of God to defeat it. Needs the light of heaven to come into our darkness and shatter all of it. The only way to rescue and restore us was to come down into our lives, giving himself, bringing us up out of the muck and the mire, cleaning us up perfectly, but the only way we could be cleaned up is if he took it upon himself. The muck and the sewage that I saw this week was absolutely revolting. But it's nothing. It is nothing compared to the grossness of my sin and your sin. But the grossness of my sin and your sin is nothing compared to the love of Jesus Christ our Lord. And when we connect with him, the truth is all is well. And nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. The ways we hurt each other are terrible. They're gross. The wars in this world and the bullying in schools and the division in families, the greed and how people will mistreat each other just for monetary profit the addictions to chemicals. How people have such broken views of themselves. They don't know their love. They hurt their own bodies. They, they take their own lives. We're broken. But we're deeply loved. His saving way. His all is well. Is enough. If we just believed in him and connect with him, his way is enough to rescue us from all that grossness and brokenness because he is far better than our, our worst stuff. Even, the scriptures say, even the angels long to look down at this and they say, oh my word, God is amazing. Look at how good he is. We knew he's good. We live in his presence. But look at how good he is. How loving he is. The result. The result of this good plan that Micah saw so many centuries ago is, is that we should, we should declare the majesty of the name of the Lord our God. Majesty, the excellence of our God. We should declare and rejoice that we have a king who not only came to us, but a king who came down into our unwellness and faced our difficulties and overcame them by dying in our place and putting to death our sin and therefore robbing death of its sting. And he rose from the grave by his spirit to give us new life. This is our true hope. This is our security. This is what brings us peace because our God became vulnerable. Our God became broken for us. Our God became a servant. Our God took death upon himself. He is the perfect one who took upon our 
our imperfections and defeated the enemies we could not defeat. And this is amazingly good news. And this should cause us to praise him and weep before him in joy. You know, the, the angels broke forth in singing and declared the good news of the baby born in Bethlehem to the shepherds. And that is absolutely amazing. And I can, I can basically guarantee that that day they would say, that is the most amazing day of my life. At that time, they would say that. The angels declared that the baby born in Bethlehem is the promised one. And we got to see that and believe that. But I believe that those shepherds, if they continued to live for a few more decades, that something would eclipse that day for them. That greatest day when they saw the angels sing and then they saw the baby lying in a manger, wrapped in swaddling cloths. Amazing. But when they heard, when they heard, that that baby was the Son of God who lived a perfect life and died on the cross for their sin and defeated evil and death and offers forgiveness for everything broken they'd ever done or thought or said and offers a new kingdom for their people and people of all nations. When those shepherds who were still alive heard that message that the baby born in Bethlehem became the great shepherd who leads us in the strength of God's love and, and rescues us into his family. When the day they heard that good news, that became the best day of their life. The Christmas story is part of the great good news story of what Jesus came to do. Darkness thought that they had defeated that baby born in Bethlehem thought that they defeated him by by killing that carpenter who walked in the Galilee they killed him on a cross but we we have the story to tell that the grave could not hold him God's love was too great and the Spirit of God raised up the Son of God Jesus from the grave and he left our sin and death in the grave, in the tomb, so that we could say, all is well in Jesus Christ. My life is now connected to his when I believe in him. I have new life. Death is defeated. My sin is gone. It's separated as far as the east is from the west. I have security in him. I will praise him. I will dwell now secure for he is great. Glory is due to his name. We should bow down before him. Great is the Lord and worthy of praise. His name should be known to the ends of the earth, including here on the Palouse. Who else does he want to shepherd? He's not done yet because he's still drawing men and women and children to himself. To the ends of the earth, this story is too good to hide and there are still people who need to have that best day in their life when they realize that they can dwell securely because there's a God who loves them, who knows their worst and he took their utter worst and gave them his utter best. He, he has cleaned them from the inside out. He's done everything necessary for them to be made new, to be restored, to be made whole, to be made full. All is well in Christ, but there are some who do not know that. But we know, and it is our day, it is our day to announce this good news, to pray for hearts that would receive it. Who is one person, at least one person, that you want to have received that good news? Is there one person here today that needs to hear that good news and receive it and say, all is well in Christ, I believe. He came down to take my worst upon himself and give me his best. Forgive me and invite me into his life now and forever. He is the shepherd who shepherds in the strength of his love. He is my peace, my wholeness. Oh Lord, I pray that your people who are hearing this message, that Lord, help us to just turn to you whether our eyes are open, our eyes are closed. I pray that some, if they're moved by your spirit, would put their hands out with their hands up and just believe that they are receiving blessing from you right now. 
that you are empowering them by your spirit as they, as they pray to you, Lord. I pray that they would pray for a face or a name to speak to, to share the good news, that you could, could help them to give someone they know the good news that would help them have the best day of their life, the day where they, they realize and come to you as a child made new by faith, by trusting in you. Oh Lord, place in our hands, place in our minds, place in our hearts someone you know that we need to share with. Who is it, Lord? Who can we be sharing this good news with? We thank you, O oh Lord, that you have shared this good news with us. And I pray that if there are any here today in the sound of my voice that are hearing this good news and they're saying, yes, I believe all is well in Christ, and they're really believing that for the first time, Lord, I pray that you would help them pray right now. Oh, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the one that was promised. You came to take my worst upon your perfect self. And I believe in you and that you put to death my sin and my death by your death. And I believe you are making me new even now. And I rejoice that I am part of your family. Oh Lord, if there's any who prayed this today, I pray that you just envelop them with your love and surround them with fellow believers who encourage them and build up their new walk with you, Lord. And if there are any believers here today who somehow have lost wonder and awe of you and your story, whatever, Lord, is keeping them from the truly majestic story of your goodness, whatever's distracting them, whatever's hurting them, whatever's clouding them from rejoicing and letting loose and just praising you and, and letting Christmas be all about you, Lord, whatever it is, just release them from it and, and deepen their joy and release in us the power of loving like you love. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.